let's discuss random sampling. So one thing that we haven't talked about, um, we talked about that when we are looking at samples and sample sizes, we know that the sample sizes should be large enough. And we also hear these words of random samples. Well, let's explore the type of sampling methods that are good and the type of sampling methods that are bad. And it's important to understand how data was sampled, how it was collected, um, so that you understand whether it was done correctly or not. Did it avoid bias? Did it um, represent the population that they are trying to make inferences about? So a sample is biased if it overrepresents or underrepresents some segment of the population. So for example, if I was talking about all university students, um, and let's say that I sampled 95% white university students and only 5% non-white university students, that would be a biased sample. I am not randomly selecting university students and um, creating a sample that has equal representation of what a university student is. And when you sample um, and you you do it biasly, you end up skewing the results because you are only you are not equally representing all the nationalities in this case that fit the population you've defined for your target. Now, if I defined my target as only white university students, well, then that becomes a whole different story. That's different. But there's still a way that I can make that bias because what if I only focus on the students whose GPA is 3.5 or higher? Okay, that's also misrepresenting your defined population. So you want to make sure that when you choose your target population, when you define that target population, you truly understand who makes up your target and that you randomly sample in order to alleviate bias. In some cases, completely randomly sampling is not the best way to go, especially if you have like the example of multiple nationalities that make up my population, you might want to do a different type of good sampling method that's still random, but ensures a bit more that each nationality is represented in your sample. Now, the sampling frame is a list which identifies all members of the population. A census is a countermeasure of an entire population while a sampling is a countermeasure of part of the population, which makes sense because we're talking about sampling here. Um, so you've heard census most likely when referencing the uh, United States survey that happens every 10 years where it is required by law that we comply to the census. Um, not that they really ever come after people who don't reply, but um, they, their purpose is to calculate uh, the different nationality breakdown of our country, um, financial breakdown, households, what they look like, and so on. Even with the best methods of sampling, a sampling error can occur. A sampling error is the difference between the results of the sample and the actual values from the populations. And even if we do everything right, sampling errors are not always avoidable. Some of sampling errors are due to the actual sample, the design of the experiment or the way that you sampled, and other errors are simply human errors, miscalculation, um, misrecording, um, a tally mark. So there are many ways that sampling errors can occur, and we're human. We are naturally flawed, and therefore our samplings are always going to have some level of error margin. Now, when we randomly sample, we are literally talking completely random. So for example, if I take all the students in my class and give them each a number, one through 24, let's say, and then I say, okay, I'm gonna randomly select five of my students to hold a position on a council, um, like a board of council members or something to do with 
class. Well, what I would do for it to be completely random where I am not considering nationality, I'm not considering sex, I'm not considering GPA or any other factors that define an individual. I literally just want randomly five students out of my class. Well, I would take those 24 assigned numbers and throw them into a hat, mix them all up and select five pieces of paper out of the hat. And that would be randomly sampling because I have no idea who student eight is, but maybe that's the piece of paper that I picked and whoever is assigned the number eight would then become part of my sample. Now, a simple random sample is every possible sample of the same size that has the same chance of being selected. So it's really important to know and simple random sample is abbreviated capital SRS very, very commonly. Um, that when you're doing a simple random sample, it is so important that everybody in the population had an equal opportunity to make it in. Like giving out numbers to everyone in your population and picking out of a hat. Well, if every single person in your population has been assigned a number and is represented in the place where you are choosing your random sample, then they do all have an equal opportunity of being selected out of that hat. But if you walk into, let's say I'm targeting all Northwestern students, I walk into one of the buildings on campus and then I feel like it's random because they, they randomly crossed my path. It feels random to me. I don't know them. And I say, okay, uh, Katie, you just walked by me. You are going to be in my sample. That's totally random because I don't know you and you randomly walked by me. No, that is the opposite of random. That is super convenient. You walked into a building and there's nothing random about that. So everybody who's an online student at Northwestern or who takes night classes, because let's say you're there during the day, they did not have an equal opportunity to walk past you at that exact moment. Plus, maybe you're in a specific science building and there's English majors that never have to enter the science building. So they don't have an equal opportunity of making it into your sample since you've chosen a building that they don't even have classes in. So what we may have considered random occurrences that happen to us, that is not statistical randomness. So be careful of the difference. So random numbers can be generated by either a random number table, a software program, or a calculator. So the table is super old school, but it works. It can randomly produce numbers. Um, it's designed by an algorithm, so it's not completely random. And you can choose your samples. Now, what can make it even more random is not always starting in the same place in the table. Then there's software and calculators that is what most people would use to produce random integers in order to create random samples. And there's a random number a generator in your calculator, in Excel, and in our guru. Signing a number to each person in the population is extremely important, as I mentioned, because everybody needs an equal opportunity to be able to make it into that sample. Members of the population that correspond to these numbers become members of the sample. Another sampling technique is stratified. So stratified is used when that situation I was talking about where I was targeting university students, but I know that there's a mix of nationality and that it it's important to my study that those nationalities are represented properly. Well, I would want to use a stratified sample then. So I would want to break up the population into strata, which are the groups of the characteristics um, of interest. So in this case, the characteristic of interest is nationality. So I would break everybody up by their dominant nationality. I would ask them what they identify by because a lot of us are mixed. So we may feel like I identify with one side over another. You would have to have them choose an identity though. They can't exist in two different strata at the same time. That would affect the uh, probability of them getting selected would increase because they are part of two strata. So we don't want to do that. We want equal likelihood of people getting into that sample out of their one group. 
Now, what makes it random, they're, they're separated into nationality groups. That's not very random. That's very specific. But what makes your sampling method random is then you apply simple random sample to each one of the strata. So let's say that the white strata, there are twice as many than any other nationality strata that I have. Well, if that's the case, then I may want to proportionally pull 50% of the sample from the white, maybe not 50%, maybe 25% of the sample made up from the white strata, and I'll randomly select. Um, let's say I want to create a sample size of um, 800, so 25% of 800 is 200, so 200 randomly selected university students from the white strata, and then I split up the remaining 600 spots amongst the other strata, which are um, smaller, much smaller. I could do it in that way so that the proportionality of the population is withheld inside of my stratified sample. It doesn't have to though, you can do it equally. So if I was doing a sample size of 800 and let's say I had, oh, I don't know, 20 different nationalities represented in 20 different strata, then I could take 800 and divide by 20, and that tells me that I need to randomly select 40 random students from each strata in order to create my sample of 800 with equal representation of nationality. So it really depends on the type of experiment you're running and whether the proportionality of the characteristic that you're focused on is important or not. Cluster sampling sounds very much like stratified because they're both talking about these groups that we're making, but cluster sampling is done for completely different reasons than stratified. So remember, stratified is used when you need certain characteristics to be represented in your sample and you don't want to risk randomly sampling the population and one of those characteristics that didn't make it in. But cluster sampling is about making a very large population um, more accessible, easier to sample. For example, right now we are doing polling for the election coming up and um, what happens is there, there's no way that they can poll every registered citizen on who they plan to vote for for president. So what happens, they have, everything's grouped into clusters. Those clusters are grouped together by your registration to vote. So your, your area, like a zip code, um, and they randomly select an entire zip code. So let's say that they selected one zip code from every state, and in that zip code, they would then call every single registered voter in that zip code. So they are randomly selecting entire groups, but the difference is, is you do not randomly select again in those groups like you did with stratified. Those groups, the whole thing makes it into your sample. So the the zone one or the, the zip code from Connecticut, everybody in that zip code is in the sample. And the zip code they chose from Maine, everybody in that zip code is in the sample and so on. Okay, one of the more straightforward ways to sample is systematic. This sometimes is a great method because it's so simple, but another times it's very tedious. So all systematic means is that you pick a number, let's say every third house as demonstrated in this picture, and you literally have to go every third house. Now let's say that 186 here did not answer their door or shut their door in my face because they didn't want to answer my question. You can't go to 187. You have to continue the pattern and move on to 286 and just mark 186 as non-response. The other thing that you have to remember, and I used to do this very large project in class where students would have to sample from a target population of their choice and conduct a survey. Well, I had some ambitious students before and they chose to do systematic sampling out of the phone book, but what they didn't realize is that once they reached their sample size of 60, they couldn't stop. Because when you do systematic sampling, in order for equal opportunity for the entire phone book to make it into your sample, you have to complete through A through Z in sampling. So they've, there were many other reasons why that sampling method didn't work out for them very well, um, and they moved on to 
um, a totally different sampling method because of that. So um, I would say systematic sampling would be conducive for a smaller population, like let's say attendees at a concert. Okay, that's still thousands of people, but it's not millions, so that's doable. Convenience sampling is one of our bad sampling methods. Okay, it's choosing only members of a population that are easy to get to, like walking into one of the buildings at Northwestern and whoever randomly walks by me is now going to be a part of my sample. Um, that is not a good sampling method because I am not giving the equal opportunity to all the subjects in my population that I'm targeting. Um, and I could easily be creating some very bad bias. Like if I was just in one building at Northwestern and it's again, the science building, well, then it's very likely that I am collecting a sample of STEM students, science, technology, engineering, math students. But what if my survey was talking about what's your favorite subject on campus well, that now created a very biased sample because I collected students whose majors are some sort of um, technology, math, engineering, science, and therefore my results are going to show that. The other type of really poor sampling methods is voluntary response. So when you are conducting a voluntary response survey, um, essentially, it's what the radio does. They Let's say they put out a new song and they ask you if you love it or hate it. The only people who are calling in are the people who care enough to call in. It's voluntary response. So the people who are loving that artist, no matter what they sing, even if it's the alphabet, they're going to call in and say it was great. Or you have people who just absolutely hate that artist or that's and then they're extremists. They're calling in to, ex to, to express their extreme opinion. But those neutral people who really don't care either way and heard the song and really like it because they actually like it or they dislike it for specific reasons, those are the people that we should be hearing from and are not likely to take time out of their day to voluntarily respond to the survey. So let's try some examples. You divide the student population with respect to majors and randomly select your question. Um, randomly select and question some students in each major. What type of sampling method are we using? Okay, so keyword here is divide. So we know there were two methods we learned that used groups, so we can narrow it down to stratified or cluster. And now the distinguishing difference between those two is after the groups were created, did we randomly select in those groups to create our sample? Or did the randomly selected groups out of the whole population make it into the sample as a whole? So I keep reading and this says that we were divided into majors and then randomly selected. So this definitely would constitute a stratified sampling. How about you assign each student a number and generate random numbers. You then question each student whose number is randomly selected. So that would give us our simple random sample where we are not taking into account any characteristics of our population is completely selected at random. You select students who are in your biology class. Well, that doesn't sound like you have done a lot of homework on, um, on, on random sampling because if you are choosing the students without any randomness behind it, even though you might feel like it's completely random, we are human, we have subconsciouses, nothing's completely random when we do it as a human. So this would be a convenience sampling method. And this concludes our lesson on different sampling techniques and the good ones, the bad ones, and what it means to create a bias.